often start off by asking a question, but today instead I want to tell you a story. I'm not sure if it's a true story, but it's a story that makes a point. There was a pastor and his family that were new to this church community, and they were visiting people, and they went to visit this, this uh, little old lady, the typical little old lady in her home, and the children were intrigued because this lady had a parrot. And the parrot would talk, but the parrot didn't say all that much. The parrot had been around the lady for a long time, and so whenever the parrot talked, it would just say two words. It would say, let's pray. Let's pray. You know, you can mention a prayer request, and the parrot would say, let's pray. So anyway, the children bugged their dad, the pastor, to get them a parrot. So he went to the parrot store, or went to the pet store, and they had a number of parrots. They were all very, very expensive, but there was one that was really discounted, and he didn't ask why. He just thought, I'm going to get this deal. So he bought the parrot, took it home, and unfortunately, he discovered the reason the parrot was discounted is because it had been previously owned by someone who wasn't really careful about what they said around this parrot. And this parrot was in the habit of saying some things that we shall say just weren't appropriate. So he's like, what am I going to do? So I know what let's take our parrot over to this lady's house and put it with her parrot And then her parrot can have a positive influence on our parrot And so they made arrangements to do that and they went over to the lady's house with the parrot They put the two parrots in the same cage And the parrots were looking at each other Eyeing each other and the pastor saying, is this gonna work? I hope that parrot influences the other parrot And the lady pair the female parrot the other one's a male parrot by the way the female parrot says let's pray nothing male parrot doesn't say anything parrot says, maybe this is working he's listening he's going to pick up on the spiritual things that he needs to say and then the female parrot said let's pray and after about 10 15 seconds the male parrot says hey sweetie how about a kiss and the female parrot says my prayers have been answered well anyway Say, what in the world has that got to do with anything we're going to talk about in the bible we're going to be talking today about influence about influence and uh, you know the pastor had thought that maybe he could take his parrot that would say things that were not appropriate and be influenced by this lady's parrot who said spiritual wonderful things and unfortunately the influence kind of went the other way but we're going to talk a little bit about influence influence who or what is influencing you and not only who or what is influencing you, but who are you influencing? Now, you might stay here and say, you know what? I'm not a person out in front of people. I'm very kind of shy. Maybe you say, I'm one of the introverted. I'm not the extroverted. So I don't have much of an influence. I'm not likely to have much of an influence in my life. But you know what? You have a lot more influence than you think. Sociologists tell us that the most introverted person will have some kind of influence over 10,000 people in their lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have like some major influence, but as you go through life, you will have some kind of influence at a minimum of 10,000 people in your lifetime. John Maxwell, a pastor, leader, one who's known for leadership, says this. He says, the issue is not whether you influence someone. What needs to be settled is what kind of influence will you be? And so we're going to be talking about influence today. We're going to be talking about our influence on others and what influences us. And today the sermon is the final sermon in the series that I've been doing called Christ-like. Christ-like. And if you have missed any of the previous ones, you can watch them or listen to them online. But we've been talking about being Christ-like. How can we be Christ-like? We started by saying, why should we be Christ-like? But how can we be Christ-like? What are those things about Jesus' life and his person and the way he acted and the way things he said and the way he responded to God and to other people that we can emulate, that we can uh, take as an example, that we can imitate in our own lives so that we can become like him? Because the Bible tells us in, in, in Romans chapter 8 that that's one of God's primary goals for us that we be conformed to the image of his son christ-like and today as we wrap up this sermon series the title of our message is follow me as i follow christ follow me as i follow christ you may recognize that statement it's something that paul said in the passage we're getting ready to read here in just a second and it's a concept that he said many times in his letters i found uh, i think seven different times when, G when when paul told the people he was writing to to imitate him to follow him to uh, follow his example 
But let's, let's look at our passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 23. If you're not familiar with Corinthians, uh, it's a letter of Paul to the Corinthian church, the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had a lot of problems, okay? But he starts off here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, and he's quoting what probably people in Corinth were saying, and that is, all things are lawful. And they were saying, listen, we know there's, a pro you know there's stuff in our lives that you don't agree with, you don't like, but that's okay. Christ has set us free. You know, we can live however we want, and God will forgive us for our sins and this, that, and the other. And so he's quoting, says, all things are lawful, but then Paul's response is, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, but his for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. And then verse 1 of chapter 11 really belongs with chapter 10 is where he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Or as some translations would follow me as I follow Christ. Now, if you're like me and you just read that uh, kind of off the cuff, off the surface, it's like I can understand the beginning part of it. I can understand the end part of it. What's that part in the middle about eating meat and not eating meat and, and, and sacrifices and all that? And I'll just just explain it to you really, really, really quickly. One of the issues they dealt with then that we don't have to deal with now, but the principles are still the same, is that they would go to the market and they would buy their meat for the, you know, buy their food, buy their meat. And they did not know unless it was advertised or told to them whether that meat had just come straight from the butcher or if that meat was part of an animal that had been sacrificed at a local idol temple. Because what would happen is people would bring sacrifices to the idol temples and it would be sacrificed and then the people at the idol temple would then sell it in the market to make some money off of it. And if you read all of 1 Corinthians and earlier on, Paul basically deals with this. He says, listen, you know, that meat, it's not any different than any other meat. We know that idols, they're not real gods, okay? I mean, in Paul's writings, he talks about how people that are offering sacrifices to idols are actually sacrificing to demons. But he says, basically, it's just meat, so it doesn't really matter. But what he's saying in this passage is that there are some people who have very, very strong convictions, People who weren't Christians, but they were Jews, and they were trying to reach out to the Jews. People who were Christians, that they weren't sure, should we eat this meat or not? And so basically what he's saying is that, you know, buy your meat, eat it. If you go to somebody's house and they're not a believer, and they serve you meat, and, and they don't say anything. You don't know where the meat came from. You don't know if it was just bought straight from the butcher or if it came through an idol temple. Just eat it because it doesn't matter. You know, God created all things to be enjoyed and food and all that kind of stuff. He says, but if they tell you this is meat that was offered in a sacrifice, he says, don't eat it. Not because it's wrong for you, but because it might be a bad witness to the person that's the non-believer. Or if there's another believer that's there that they're wrestling in their conscience, they're not sure, and they see you eat that meat, say, why is he doing that? It would be a bad example for them. He says, because what it all comes down to is I'm not going to live for myself. I'm going to live for God, but I'm also going to live to be a good example to others so that hopefully they can come to know God and grow closer to God. That's what he means when he says, you know, I try to please everyone. He didn't mean he was a people pleaser. I mean, he sought, first of all, to please God, and he would do absolutely nothing that didn't please God. But other than that, he had chosen he was not going to live for himself, for his own desires, for his own preferences, but he was going to live his life in such a way that he could touch many people for Jesus Christ. So that's what is behind this. So, so what is he saying here? And I already kind of said this, but let me just lay it out in kind of a, a, a very simple format. 
Number one, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. That's what he says at the end. Whether you eat or you don't, you know, whether you eat this meat or don't eat this meat, or you, you're worried about whatever, you, whatever decision you make is right between you and God about this issue. Now, let me make it very clear that Paul was very, very strong about if God says you should do something, you need to do it. If God says you should not do something, you should not do it. But there are other areas that God has not spoken clearly on, and it's a gray area, and you've got to pray and determine what you're supposed to do before God. That's what he's talking about. So he says, whatever you do, if you choose to eat this meat, if you choose to get meat that even was part of a sacrifice, and you eat it in your home, and you do that, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. Whether you eat or not, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And that applies not just to what we eat, but to every area of life. Whatever we do, that should be our first and primary goal. I want to do what I'm doing for the glory of God. And the second one follows up with whatever you do, do for the good of others. And he's got teaching all through his letters, especially in Philippians, when he uses the example of Jesus, that we do not live just for ourselves. God has called us into this world to be his representatives. And we need to serve him and we need to serve others and share the love of Jesus with others. So we need to do what we do for the good, glory of God and for the good of others. And, and there's two different aspects to that. There's a negative aspect. You don't want to be a bad example and cause someone to stumble. But you want to be a good example because you want to see people saved. And you want to see them growing in the Lord. And so Paul says the best way to do this is to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. Become like Christ. This is the passion. This is the desire. This is what, um, what Paul is saying. We need to become more like Christ. This is what God has for us. And he says, if we can be like Christ, this is great. So he says, so be Christ-like, which means you need to be just like me. Now, that strikes us as a little bit strange, right? Again, that, that, that statement, that the title of our message, follow me as I follow Christ, or in the English Standard Version, which I read from, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Another translation is follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I said a few minutes ago, he talks similar to this in, uh, earlier in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Philippians, in two places, 2 Timothy, he talks about people following his example. Why did he say that? Why didn't he just say, be like Jesus? And there were certainly many statements he made about how we need to be like. Why, did he, why didn't he just say, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, be like Jesus? No, he puts himself out and says, follow me as I follow Christ. Probably you could come up with the right answer, but I thought to make this very clear, we would do something kind of fun today. So we're going to play a game. Uh, we're going to play follow the leader. You know how to play follow the leader? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ask, I already talked to Kyle. Kyle's going to be involved. Kyle's going to go to the back. Kyle's going to be the leader, all right? Now, this is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be a very modified version of Father Leading. Those of you that are home, you can play too, all right? So just do what I ask you to do, and you'll be good to go, all right? So we're going to play follow the leaders. It's going to be very, very modified. Kyle's going to be the leader. He is only going to do things with his hands and his arms, all right? But here's where it's a little bit different. Do not look at Kyle, if you look at Kyle, you are cheating. You need to look at me. That's why you at home can do this because you can't see Kyle. He's standing in the back. All right? All right, so everybody, you keep looking up here. Keep, don't, don't look back there. If somebody next to you looks back there, just poke him in the ribs, but don't crack any, okay? All right, so look up here. All right, Kyle, do something with your hands or arms. All right, everybody do what Kyle did. Like some of you are getting close, but most of you, why aren't you doing what Kyle did? You can't see him. Oh, let's try it again. Kyle, do something else. Don't look back there. Okay, do what Kyle did. <laughs> Got some really good people guessing, but you're not even close, Lori. <laughs> it's very interesting. She was flapping her arms like a chicken. Uh, but that is a very good guess of something Kyle would do. Anyway. All right, now let's change it up a little bit. Don't look back there. But when Kyle does something, I'm going to do the same thing. All right, so you keep looking up here, and when Kyle does something, I want you to do what Kyle did. Okay, so Kyle, do something. Do what Kyle did. You guys did great. Can you see Kyle? No. Okay, let's, let's try it one more time, and then we'll quit. Okay, so Kyle, do something else. All right, go. Do what Kyle did. You're all wrong. See, but I did what you did what I did, right? I didn't do what Kyle did. Let's, let's give a hand of applause to Kyle. Thank you, Kyle, for being the leader and follow the leader. 
you can probably figure out some of the points I'm trying to make. And that is that people could not see Jesus. Jesus was no longer on the earth. They did not yet have the New Testament written down where they could sit down with their copy of Matthew or Mark or Luke or John and read all about Jesus' life. Now, lots of stories were circulating, okay? They knew a lot about Jesus because they had a very oral culture, okay? And um, they would memorize stories, and they'd be passed all along very faithfully, so they knew a lot about it, but they could not see Jesus. And basically, Paul was saying, listen, I know a lot about Jesus, and I am trying really hard to live like Jesus. So follow me as I follow Christ. Just as you were not able to do what Kyle did back then, because you couldn't see him. There were people that says, well, we don't know how to be like Jesus. We don't know enough about him. And so Paul says, look to me. And when Kyle did that one thing and I did the exact same thing, you all were able to do it. But when he did the other thing and I did something else, you couldn't do it. And that speaks to the fact that if we are not closely following Jesus and becoming like Jesus in the areas where we're not like Jesus and people follow our example, they're not going to be like Jesus either. So that's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So as we continue to talk about this idea of influence and becoming Christ-like, I want to talk about the importance of why we should do that. You see, Jesus is hard to follow unless we see him in others. And as I said, even the most introverted of each and every one of you has already and will have influence over any number of people. And I would say that God wants them to see Jesus in you. And there's an old song that says, you're the only Jesus that some will ever see. There are people that you are around or may be around in the course of your life that will never go to church. That will never perhaps be around any other Christians or believers who strongly live out their faith. And you may be the only Jesus that some will ever see. You see, we influence everybody we come in contact with. And we are influenced by everyone we come in contact with. And I want to challenge you today. As we hear Paul say this 11 verse 11 uh, chapter 1 uh, chapter 11 verse 1 follow me as I follow Christ or imitate me as I imitate Christ I want to challenge you to take that as a motto to try to live up to in your own life in other words as we're wrapping up this series on being Christ-like it's in our best interest to be Christ-like it's God's goal for us. We'll be the best me. I can be the best me I can be by being Christ-like. But I can have such a powerful influence over other people too. So I challenge you. I challenge you to take that as your motto also. Now that can be kind of overwhelming. And I can tell you that I'm not perfect at it even after 50-something years. I'm still working on it. We're all in different places. But I think it's important that we set it as a goal that we're constantly working toward and becoming better and better at knowing that maybe we will never become perfect but the closer we draw to Christ and the more we come like him the more we're able to have that kind of an influence on other people well I want to take the rest of our time today to talk about two different sets of questions that I wrestle with and I hope that you will wrestle with too and the first set of questions is this who are you following and where are they leading you who are you following? You know, before we get to the whole thing of people following me or people following you, people following us, let's talk about who are you following? Because you are influenced by the people that you are following. Who are you following and where are they leading you? And the first question I would ask you under this is, are you following Jesus? Are you following Jesus? Now, I don't mean by this that you know about Jesus. You might say, I believe in Jesus, and I think he was a great guy, and I know some stuff about Jesus, but are you a follower of Jesus? The most important aspect of this is that we need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single one of us that are in this room, every single one of you that are watching this on the live stream or the recording um, at some other point, we each need a personal relationship with Jesus because we all have a very, very big personal problem. The Bible makes it very clear that we are all sinners and that our sin separates us completely and totally 
from a relationship with God. But the Bible also makes it very, very clear that there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. We try so hard sometimes. We may decide, I'm going to be a good person. We may decide we're going to try to be Christ-like. We're talking about that, right? And we're going to do it in our own strength and our own ability. You know, I'm going to do good things. I'm going to spend time reading God's Word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to give to church and other good causes. I'm going to give my time to do good things and help other people. And those are all wonderful things to do. Those are all things that God would love for us to do. But the Bible makes it very clear that that cannot save us from our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, since there was nothing we could do about it, God determined, and in his knowledge, way before he even created the world, he knew it was going to happen. He created a solution, and that was for Jesus to come. Jesus, God himself, come to earth to become man also, in addition to being God, to live the perfect life that we cannot live, to die a death he did not deserve, and in God's way of working things out, that our sin was placed on Jesus, and his death paid the price for it. And so if we turn to him, it's not an automatic thing. It's a gift. We have to receive that gift. If we turn to him and ask God to forgive us of our sins, not on the basis of what we've done or we'll try to do the rest of our lives, but on the basis of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that God will forgive us of our sins. And if you've not done that, I challenge you, I encourage you to do that today. To make that decision, to step over that line, to surrender that control. I will tell you it's one of the most simple things you can do, but it will require a good bit of effort to live out. Because you see, if we truly are sorry for the sins in our lives that have separated us from God and ask God to forgive us because Christ paid for it, that means we're going to leave them behind. And that's a struggle, but God promises us his help. So I challenge you to do that. So I ask you, are you a follower of Jesus? Not just from afar, not just, oh, I kind of pay attention to what he says and try to live, but you actually have committed your life to Christ. You've surrendered your life to him. And not just that initial act or response of a prayer and surrender and accept him as your savior, but honestly trying to live your life to please him. Are you following Jesus? as your Savior and Lord? Are you, are you growing in your relationship? And, and we are so tempted to try to follow two roads at once. And Jesus had a lot of teachings. You cannot follow two roads at once. You can't follow him on one road and try to follow the world on another one. So are you following Jesus? The second question underneath this, this set is, who else are you following? Besides Jesus and your attempts or not, non-attempts, to who else are you following in your life? John said in his third letter, chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 11, he says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil has not seen God. He's basically saying, listen, you need to follow, you need to look to as influence in your life, you need to, uh, to imitate people who are doing good. So who else are you following? Are you following godly influences? I hope you are. I would believe you are. You're here in church among the rest of God's people. So at least this morning, there's an aspect of wanting to be among other godly influences and, and take in godly influence. There's a number of places in the scripture it talks about this, but in Hebrews 13, 7, it says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. He says, if your leaders are the type of leaders they should be, and they're becoming Christ-like, and they are following Jesus, you should look to them and see in them an example that you can hopefully follow. I would add to this, you know, when we look at Paul say, follow me as I follow Christ, I like that last part, as I follow Christ, is kind of a conditioner. In the sense of Paul saying, follow me as long as you believe I'm following Christ. If you see me doing something you know Jesus wouldn't do, don't do that part. And can I tell you that if you would all look to me or to my wife or any of our staff or our elders or deacons as leaders of this church, as examples to follow, I would say the same thing. In any way in which you see we're following Jesus and we're living up to God's word, then I pray that our example would be an encouragement to you to do the same. 
But if you ever see or hear words that come out of our mouth or sense in us an attitude or whatever that's not truly Christ-like, please have grace and mercy because we're still human beings and we're still working on it. But don't follow that part. Don't imitate that part. And I would just say for myself, I would ask that you lovingly come and speak to me if you see anything in my life that's not Christ-like because I want to be Christ-like. You know, I, I'm still working on it. So, who else are you following? Godly influences? But how about ungodly influences? I could have had a whole list of scriptures about the negative influences of people and circumstances in our world that if we're not careful, we can be influenced by that and be led the wrong direction and do the wrong things. You know, Paul said in another place, bad company corrupts good character, you know, and lots of stuff in Proverbs about, you know, the influence of other people in your life. And I would say, would you look, if you look at your life, you know, how much godly influence is there and how much ungodly influence is there? I've shared this before, but especially when I was a youth pastor, I would often get the question of, from young people who really had a passion to love and serve Jesus. It's like, well, what about my friends? I've got a lot of friends that aren't Christians. Is it okay to be friends that aren't Christians? And, and even adults, we deal with that. You know, when we, we, we go to work and we go to wherever we go and there are people around us, some are godly, some are ungodly, and, and the relationships we have with them and, 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 you know, the church as a whole has had to wrestle with this. Do we isolate away from the world? And I can tell you that the biblical principle principle is not to isolate away from the world jesus said we should be a light in the world we should be the salt of the world we should be having a positive influence on the world and we can't have that if we isolate from the world so the general overview overall answer to the question is no you don't need to Get away from your non-Christian friends and cut them all out of your life. And, and when you're at work, only talk to other people that are Christians and try to avoid the non-Christians. That's the opposite of what God would want us to do. But yet we do see principles in God's word that we need to make sure we're standing strong and that we are influencing them. They are not influencing us. And that is my answer that I've given all through the years. When people say... I've got this friend in my life. I'm not really sure if I should hold on to that friendship or what it should be like or whatever. I say, well, who is influencing whom? Are you influencing them or are they influencing you? Are you bringing them up and showing them Jesus and maybe drawing them closer to him or are they drawing you away from Christ and tempting you to sin and maybe they've already caused you to fall because you see there may be certain instances where there are individuals that we do need to back off from. There may even be situations where there are individuals in our life that we need to cut ourselves off from. If they're going to cause us to fall and they're going to cause us to fail and they're going to draw us away from our relationship with Jesus Christ. But can I also tell you that there are people that you've never met that have a tremendous influence on you? Say, what do you mean? Through things that they've done and said... What I mean by this is that this influence we're talking about, godly influence versus ungodly influence, has to do with anything that we allow into our lives and into our minds. The books we read, the TV shows we watch, the movies we watch, the music we listen to, anything that comes into our life. Now, I'm not what they used to call a clothesline preacher where I'm going to tell you what you can and can't watch and listen to and all that kind of stuff other than to tell you that if you have a passion for Jesus Christ, you need to filter what you allow into your mind. And as a believer, there are certain things you should not be reading and listening to and all that kind of stuff. Say, oh, but pastor, there's nothing out there. I know we all got to walk that line. We all got to pray and seek God, Lord, is it okay for me to do this, do that, to read, to watch, to listen, whatever? But can I tell you that if we are deliberately feeding garbage and ungodly stuff into our minds, that should be a sign to us that something needs to be dealt with. And again, I'm not going to stand up here and list, give you a list of TV shows and all that kind of stuff. You got to grow as believers and learn to discern. There's lots of scriptural advice about that. So as we talk about influence, and, and, and I didn't even mention the internet. The internet is a tremendous tool and resource, but it's also one of the source of the worst things in our society today. So, who are you following and where are they leading you? 
Who are you following and where are they leading you? As you seek, if it's your desire, as, as mine is, and as we've been trying to portray in this sermon, to become more and more like Christ, ask God to show you what is holding you back. And if it's because of the influence of certain things in your life, you may need to do a little pruning. The second set of questions is this, and this gets more to the root of what we're really looking at today. Who is following you and where are you leading them? Who is following you and where are you leading them? You have tremendous influence on other people, whether you like it or not. You know, if you just want evidence of it, if you are a parent or grandparent, look at how much your kids turned out like you. Even though they swore all along, I'm never going to be like you. <laughs> or look at how much you turned out like your parents, even though you swore all along, I'm never going to become like you. Now, we're not exact clones of our parents, and our kids are not exact clones of us, but there are some similarities, right? I mean, all of you that chuckled, which there were quite a few of you, and several of you that wanted to chuckle, but you didn't, you know it's true. There are things that are true of you that you saw in your parents, and whether you liked it or not, you ended up following in their example. Maybe it's because they did the right thing. You didn't like it at the time, but now you realize it was. Maybe it's just because it's in you because you're their child. And the same thing is true for our children. It can be scary. Yeah. But you have tremendous influence on others, whether you like it or not. But don't take that as a fee thing to be feared. Take that as an opportunity to be used. But can I tell you, you cannot lead somebody someplace you are not going. You are not going to lead people to become more Christ-like unless that's a goal in your life that you're pursuing. And that's just a general category, but if you look at the specific, it, you're not going to lead people to be more loving people unless you're trying to be a more loving person. You're not going to lead people to be more patient if you're not working on being more patient. You're not going to lead people to be more forgiving if you're not willing to work on being forgiving. All these different characteristics of being Christ-like and the fruits of the Spirit and the things in the Word of God that make it very, very clear that this is what God is trying to do in us and through us to make us the best people we can be. You're not going to be able to lead people to that unless you're striving to do so yourself. Let me ask you a question. Do people see Jesus in you? Do people see Jesus in you? Now, some people might not even realize it's Jesus, but they see something different in you. Many times when I'm praying, you've heard me if you've been around any length of time, Lord, do a work in our lives that people will see us and say, I want what they have. As I mentioned earlier, this is God's goal for us. Romans 8, 29. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus gave a number of illustrations. I mentioned that he said that we're the salt of the earth, or we should be the salt of the earth. Great teaching. You know, salt preserves. Salt flavors. Salt keeps things from rotting. I mean, all those applications fit us so well. But one of the other things Jesus said is that we are the light of the world. Now, Jesus started out by saying that he was the light of the world, all right? In John 8, 12 and in 9, 5, he says, I am the light of the world. But you see, Jesus left this world. And so he said after he was gone that we should be the light of the world. And he talked about that in Matthew 5, 14. He says, you are the light of the world. So this whole idea of who is following you and where are you leading them, first question under that is, where are you leading the people you know? Where are you leading the people, you, the people that are closest to you, the people that are around you, family members, co-workers, other people at school, your neighbors, children, grandchildren, your spouse, your parents, especially your unsaved family members, your friends. Where are you leading them? Heard about a father who was, uh, sat down and to talk to his son and uses a teaching moment to tell him what a Christian was. He'd heard about that, you know. What, what, Dad, what's a Christian? And so his dad set him down and said, well, a Christian is, is, is you know, a person who surrendered their life to Christ and, and, and their life is different and they're like this and this and And when the conversation was all over, his son asked a question that his father never dreamed he would ask. His son says, Dad, have I ever met one of these Christians? Don't know how to respond to that one, do we? Obviously seemed to indicate that whatever the father had described to the son, the son didn't see in the father. Where are you leading the people 
you know? What is your example like in your walk with Christ, your worship, your prayer, your godliness, and all the things that are going on in your life? Where are you leading the people you know? I mentioned that Paul said about six, seven times in his letters that people could imitate him and follow him. One of the most powerful ones is in Philippians chapter 4. Verses 8 and 9. I think you're going to really recognize verse 8. But they're tied together. In Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers and and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's a great piece of advice, just in general being Christians and you know when you talk about what do you let into your mind you know and what do you bring into your life that's a good grid to run things through you know things that are true honorable just pure lovely commendable excellent think on these things but the very next verse Paul says what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you See, I think that those verses are tied together. We often pick a verse out and just grab it and run with it. And and I'm not saying that that's never appropriate. You know, some of God's promises that way you can just grab it and run with it. But you've got to look at it in context. And I think what he's saying is you go through life, all the stuff that's true, good, just, honorable. When you see that in other people, including me, take that as an example. I like the word he uses. If you've learned it, if you've received it, if you've heard it or seen it. In other words, if you've heard it come out of my mouth or you've seen it in my life. Can I tell you that these are the two major areas in which we have influence? The things that we say and the things that we do. And you know as well as everybody else that if those two things don't agree, it's worthless. If you tell your kids, your grandkids, the people, whatever, that you should do this, this, and you don't do it, they're not going to pay attention to the thing you say. Our words, our actions, both are important. Now, there's nothing wrong with talking to people under our influence, our children, our grandchildren, our, whoever it might be, if we're involved in a ministry and say, listen, this is the way we should live in Jesus Christ, and I'm working on it. In fact, I don't even have it totally under control. There are times I lose my temper. There's times I'm not patient. But this is what we got to do. Because that way, even though you may not, they may not always see you living it out, they know you're trying and they can see you trying. But they need to agree. And which one's more important, our words or our actions? They're both important. It's like which wing of an airplane is more important? You got to have both. Which, which, which wheel on the bicycle is most, you got to have both. You got to have both and they have to match. Paul was writing to Timothy, who was a young man compared to Paul. He was probably maybe in his 20s or so. And he gave him some really good advice. You know, he was kind of young in the ministry, and, and uh, some people were kind of looking down on him. Say, oh, he's just a young guy. And Paul said this in 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I quoted that verse at the very beginning of the sermon series almost two months ago. I said that would be a great verse to memorize, to meditate on, to pray over. Whether you consider yourself a young person or not, it applies. Set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I want to tell you young people that are here today, God can use you guys powerfully. And not just with your friends and the other young people in the youth group, but with us older people too. Can I tell you, I get comments from our older people about how excited and enthused they are when they see our young people involved in ministry. Whether it's up here on the, on the platform with the worship team or they're involved with Children's Church, which we're getting ready to start back up, God willing, in a couple of weeks, or in some other areas, they are just so proud of you young people. You're never, too, you're never too young to be a good example. So as we consider the question, who is following you and where are you leading them and where are you leading the people you know, let me give you another question before we wrap this up. Where are you leading a watching world? People that don't even know you, they're watching you. Especially if they know you're a Christian. And before I do, let me ask you this question. The people that do know you, the people at work, the people at school, 
people in your neighborhood, would they be surprised to find out that you claim to be a Christian? If you do, that's something to meditate on. But where are you leading a watching world? I've already referred to this a couple of times in Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. We're going to skip 15. But Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let me give you a statement. I didn't read this. I think I made it up myself. If I got it from somewhere else, I don't remember doing so because I just wrote it down. G I'm sorry. You are the light by which the world sees Jesus. You are the light by which the world sees Jesus. Now, something I didn't say, but a fellow by the name of Henry Ward Beecher, a great preacher from back in the 1800s, he says, if you want your neighbor to see what Christ will do for him, let him see what Christ has done for you. So Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I seek to imitate Christ. Follow my example as I try to follow the example of Christ. So we wrap this up. Those questions, I think, that God wants us to meditate on, and not just this morning, but to take them with us when we leave here in a little bit and, and pray over them, meditate over them. May they shape and mold our life and our walk with him. Who are you following and where are they leading you and who is following you and where are you leading them? Do people see Jesus in you? One last scripture. We read it at the beginning of this series a couple months ago in Luke 640. It says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. We will never become as good as Christ. We will never definitely be above Christ. <laughs> Impossible. But as we become more and more trained, as we follow him more and more closely, we will become more and more like him. And that's what we've been talking about these last couple of months. How can I become Christ-like? You know, I'm not perfect yet. You're not perfect yet. But I can tell you, I want to be Christ-like. I want to be like Jesus. I want Jesus to live through me. I want people to see Jesus in me. I want people who follow my example to become more like Jesus. And you know, you might say, I can't make that much of a difference. Certainly can't make as much of a difference as you do, Pastor. You're up in front of people all the time, the whole church. And I, but you know what? Don't focus on what kind of influence you can have versus somebody else. Just know that you can make an influence. You can make a difference. I heard a story years ago, maybe you've heard it too, about an old man walking on the beach. And he sees a little boy. This is early in the morning. The sun's just come up. A little boy is walking along the beach and he's picking up starfish that have been washed up in the night. And he picks one up and he throws it out in the ocean. Picks another one up and throws it out in the ocean. And there's starfish all over the beach. And the old man asks the little boy why he's doing that. And he says, well, the starfish, if it's left stranded on the beach, when the sun comes up in its strength, it'll die. And the man said, there's millions of starfish. How can your effort make any difference? And the little boy picked up another starfish, and he threw it out in the ocean. He says, it made a difference for that one. You can make a difference. You already have an influence. What kind of influence do you have? What kind of influence do you want to have? Let's all stand together. We're going to close today as we always do. I'm going to invite my wife, our elders, to come to the front. We're going to be available for prayer for anything. You need a touch from God. You need healing. You need wisdom. You need um, something going on with some other area of your life or maybe you're burdened for somebody else and you want somebody to pray with you come we'll be glad to pray with you if you are here today and you do not know Jesus as your savior we would have the privilege of talking with you about that and praying with you to see that happen you can come for that but while we're praying Nathaniel will be playing and leading a song and you can sing along you can meditate on the message today I would certainly encourage you to do that and to respond 
begin to respond. Make any commitments. Do some self exam Whatever it is that God is working on your heart, take this time. It's a very rich time to interact with the Lord. Talk to Him. Respond to Him. And in a little bit, I'll come up and close in prayer. But if you need prayer for anything, we're here to pray with you. Oh, Lord. Everything we've learned through this series and talked about today, Lord, seems so difficult. And the only way, Lord God, we can be more Christ-like is by looking to you. I know we've talked about being a good influence and following good influences, and we thank you for those that are that in our lives, but we look to you. We look to you as the example. We look to you even more so for the power and the strength that we need to live the life you've called us to live. And I thank you for the promises of your word that says that when we know you, your Holy Spirit dwells within us to empower us. We depend on that, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would work in all of our lives and that you would deal with each of our hearts about the specific things, the specific areas, Lord God, in which, Lord God, you want to see things different, perhaps. And Father, I pray that we pursue those things with joy, knowing that you love us and you want what's best for us. God, I know I want to be more like you. And I pray you'd help me to do that. And Lord, I want any influence I might have in this life, Lord God, upon the people that look to me as pastor, but Lord, upon the people that look to me as their husband, their father, their papa. I'll be honest, Lord, that that's more important to me than the people that look to me as pastor. God, help me to be that man of God you want me to be. God, help each of us. We need you. But God, I thank you for your promises that you will be there for us and you will empower us and you will help us to make a difference in our world. I pray that as we leave this place in just a couple of moments, we would go forth in power and anointing of your Holy Spirit and that people would see Jesus in us and want what we have. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 God bless you. Go forth and be Jesus to your world.